Still in your hands. 
Somebody once told me that God's love is a truth that's so simple, we just need to accept it. But the truth is, the love of God is like a universe that you've never been to before. And when we try to understand God's love from his perspective, we're really just not equipped to do that. And a lot of people are really just kind of even confused about what God's love is because he doesn't love the way we do. And we love others for what they've done for us. He loves because it's his nature. It's God's nature to love. And when you know the love of God, it's one of the most amazing things. Amen? And I was looking for a way to help us understand God's love. So in this new series, which I'm calling For the Love of God, have you ever heard that saying said as a slang term? Oh, for the love of God. I think my dad used to say that. I don't know why. I just have that. I can hear it ringing in my ears. But I want us to look at God's love. And we're going to attempt to understand what God's love is really all about. And the interesting thing about knowing God is to realize that he's always loved us. And it's one of the most wonderful things to learn that and experience that. And then you get the loving back. I say this usually at funerals that it was part of my testimony that when I became a Christian, what the guy said that made me come and kneel at an altar right over there, he said, you know, we make Christianity out to be a lot of things, but all it is is a loving God wanting us to love him back. And, and I think of the movie that's out there. I, I, almost can't remember the name of it. It was uh, um, Bruce Almighty, is that what it was? God Almighty, so, where, where he was trying to get his wife to love him, and he, and he pulled the moon down and everything, and he was trying to, because he was given all these powers of God, and he, and he went to God and he says, how can I make her love me? Love me? And God looked at him and said, if you have the answer to that question, let me know. Because God wants us to love him. And yet there's so many in this world that don't even recognize that he exists. And his greatest desire, because he loves us, is for us to love him back. And, and when we know that he loves us, it makes all the difference. And, and it, it may not seem strange to any of us that anybody would doubt that fact that God loves us. But in all other religions, in all non-Christian religions, God, if God is portrayed at all as being personal, he's not a giving or loving God. But rather, he's a God of appeasement. He's a God whose demands must be satisfied in order to receive his attention. Christianity alone offers only a different picture. And the Bible tells us in our scripture text this morning in 1 John chapter 4, in verses 8 and verse 16, it says this, God is love. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And then in verse 16, it says something very similar. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. What does John mean when he says that God is love? I think, first of all, we need to understand what he doesn't mean. He's simply not saying that God loves. Although that is true, but that's not what John is saying. John is telling us here that love is the very essence of God's moral nature. He's telling us that God himself is love. And that love is not just one of his attributes but that love is who he is. God defines what true love is, and he's the source of all true love. And as your pastor, I have this burden to tell you that God is indeed love, and that he does indeed love each and every one of you. But what is, exactly does that mean? I mean, love in our world, it's kind of a confusing subject. And I recently read this, this illustration, this uh, group of questions that they asked kids. They asked a group of children, what does love mean? 
And this one little eight-year-old girl said, well, when my grandma got arthritis and she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore, my grandma would bend over and paint her toenails. Even when he got arthritis, he would still do that. That's love. And this little four-year-old boy says, when someone loves you, when they say your name, it's just different. And you know that your name is safe in their mouth. Little boy who was seven says, love is what's in a room at Christmas if you stop opening your presents and just listen. Nikki, who was six, said, if you want to learn to love, better you should start with someone you hate. And Tommy said, love is like the little old woman and a little old man who are still friends, even after they've known each other for so long. And I like this one. And Cindy said, during my piano recital, I was on stage and I was so scared. I looked out at all the people watching me and I saw my daddy out there <laughs> waving and smiling. And I wasn't scared anymore. And he was the only <laughs> one doing that. That's love. I can remember doing that for my kids. I thought I was making them feel ridiculous, but here I might have been calming their spirit. And there's a little bit of truth in each and every one of those statements. They're, they're kind of interesting and a little bit humorous. But the important thing when we begin to understand what love is, because if we're going to understand what love is, then we can understand that God is love. And God's love is so different than what we view love to be in our culture today. And when we open up the words of the pages of the Bible and we read about the love of God, what we're doing is kind of opening up this multifaceted dynamic. And we see a love in a way that we dreamed it could never be described. In fact, this is such a vast subject and it's such a wide endeavor. How could any human being ever write anything so meaningful about the love of God? And then I read this comment about a song that George Beverly Shea used to sing at every single one of the Billy Graham Crusades. And the words of the song go like this. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made in every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. What an awesome thought. The love of God is such a vast subject. It's far beyond any human ability to comprehend it. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. That we shouldn't try to learn all we can about God's love. And so in these next few moments, in these next few weeks, I want to tell you some things that I've learned about the love of God. Some of these you may know already. And some of them may come as a little bit of a surprise. But first of all, the Bible teaches us that God's love is uncaused. It's uncaused. Because in our human relationships, we love someone, we love another person because we see something in that person that attracts us. But God's love is uncaused. It's unprompted, it's uninfluenced, it's free, it's spontaneous. There's nothing we can do to cause God to love us. And there's nothing we can do to prevent him from loving us because God loves us because he's chosen to love us. He loves us because that's all he can do. God is love. And maybe you're among those who grew up thinking that you really just had to do so many good things in order for God to love you. And if you didn't, maybe he didn't. Or maybe you grew up in a family where you're kind of on a performance basis. Maybe you often heard your mother say, or once in a while heard her say, you know, if you do that, I'm not going to love you anymore. Because some folks grow up like that. And we need to put all of that behind us because if we want to learn about the love of God, we need to know that God's love is uncaused. It comes from Him. It has nothing to do with us. Not only is his love uncaused, but as we study the Bible, we begin to realize that it's also very unreasonable. It is. 
God's love is unreasonable. And Paul wrote in Romans 5, 6 through 8, For a while we were still without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely will a righteous man, will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone might even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, that's exactly what he did. We've sang about that in several of the choruses today. He died for you and me, all of us card-carrying sinners that were enemies of God. And yet it was in that situation that love manifested itself. A holy, unreasonable act of a righteous man dying in the place of us unrighteous souls. God's love is uncaused and it's unreasonable. And third, it's unending. Did you know that God's love is totally unending? The Bible says that God is love. And the Bible also tells us that God is eternal. So if God is love and he is eternal, then his love has to be eternal also. He is the everlasting God. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the one who is and was and is to come. He is almighty. See, we divide time into past and present and future, but God doesn't live in those categories. God's name is I am. It's not I was or I will be. He inhabits eternity. He is O King Eternal. Of him the psalmist wrote, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God's love is unending. There's nothing we can do to keep him from continuing to love us. His, he's loved us from the beginning, and he'll love us to the end. But next, the Bible teaches us that God's love is unlimited. Somebody has said that God's center is everywhere, and his circumference is nowhere, because he fills the heavens and the earth with his presence. First Kings 8.27 says, Behold, heaven is and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. And Paul acknowledges that fact that God is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and we move and we have our being. Where God is, love is, and God's love is unlimited. He cannot be bound to any of the structures that we know today. You may have come here to this building to experience God's love, but God is not bound to this building. Therefore, his love is everywhere. No matter where you go, you can't get away from his love. He's always going to be there in his love. The fifth thing we can look at is God's love is unchanging. In a world that changes so fast, it's almost impossible to keep up with. Our technology changes us so fast. Here's one of the characteristics of Almighty God that we need to always remember. Malachi 3.6 says it this way, For I am the Lord your God, and I change not. Psalms 33 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, his plans of his heart to all generations. And Psalms 102 says, But you are the same, and your years have no end. What a wonderful thought to know that God is unchanging. And that his love is unchanging. His love is constant and its faithfulness, it's continual in its expression. And one of the problems that we have in our culture is we hear people say things like this, well, I just don't feel like I love you anymore. And I'll tell you what, I've got a problem with that. When I hear husbands say, and you know, I, I, I just have fallen out of love with my wife. I just don't feel like I love her anymore. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us, it, the Bible tells us husbands love your wives. You know, maybe if you just choose to love, maybe that feeling will come back. So if you know somebody that's struggling in their marriage because they don't feel like loving, help them to understand it's a choice, not a feeling. Did you know that there's a good side and a better side to God's unchanging love? The good side of God's love is that he's not going to wake up in the morning and decide that he's had enough of us. The better side is that even when we mess things up in our lives, he still loves us. Amen? 
And I'm here to tell you that God loves us when we're awake and he loves us when we're asleep. No matter what condition we're in, he never stops loving us. His love is uncaused, it's unreasonable, it's unending, it's unlimited, and it's unchanging. There are those who don't recognize it, but that doesn't change who God is. Well, let me tell you the last thing about this. God's love is uncomplicated. You believe that this morning? Karl Barth was Switzerland's greatest 20th, 20th century theologian. His accomplishments as a theologian, he wrote some 13 volume, volumes of church dogmatics and theological works containing some 6 million words. And when he made a trip to the United States to speak to one of the colleges or universities, he was asked by a student to summarize these six million words about the Bible and theology that he had written. And while his audience was just awaiting to be amazed by this profound statement, he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And that's the message of God's word. Whether it's Karl Barth's six million theological documented words, or whether it's the words of the pages of the Bible from the beginning to the end, that's its message. Jesus loves me. This is do you know that God's love is uncomplicated? But the question that we need to ask after we've learned about all these attributes of his love is who does he love? Who does God love? You know, the scriptures tells us that he loves his own son. I mean, that makes sense, right? God would love his own son because on two occasions, the scripture tells us that his, own, that his love for his own son was expressed at Jesus' baptism and then at his transfiguration. For from the heavens they heard these words, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So the first thing we need to learn about who God loves when we study the Word of God is that the Bible tells us that he loved his Son, Jesus. The second thing, and it shouldn't be a surprise to us, that God dearly loves Israel. The nation of Israel. Do you know that the Bible tells us that God loves Israel? And we're reminded of how desperately this nation, these people, need to know the love of God. The Bible tells us that God loved Israel so much that it used the metaphor to describe it. And it said, as long as the sun and the moon and the stars shine in the heavens, as long as the heavens remain unmeasurable and the earth's foundations are undiscoverable, as long as that happens, God would continue to love Israel. God says, before I stop loving Israel, you're going to have to pull the moon out of the sky and the stars out of the sky, and you have to destroy the heavens and the earth before he would ever stop loving his nation. And there are many today that teach that God doesn't really even have a plan for Israel. And I don't want to argue about that, but if you read the scriptures carefully, because the Bible tells us that God loves Israel and he's got a plan for them. And it's in our best interest as a nation to remember that those who bless Israel, God blesses. And those who curse Israel, God will curse. And then let me tell you a third thing. Because we're coming down to the end of this message. Let me tell you the third thing. God loves those who believe in Christ. He has a special love for those who believe in his son. In fact, in John 17, 23, we read these words, that the world may know that you, God, have loved them as you have loved me. Jesus said, God, you love Christians in the same way that you love me. He said that. And in his letter to the Colossians, Paul wrote of Christ's followers, he wrote of us, he said, that we are the elect of God, holy and loved. God loves his son. He loves the nation of Israel. And he loves all those who love him 
But you know, one of the most important things for us to remember is that God loves the world. Saw it on the football game I was watching just the other day, John 3, 16. And, and, and I wonder how many people have seen that over and over and over again. And, and I wonder how many have seen that and sat, sat there and wondered, what the heck is that mean? I mean, we know what it means. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. It does not mean that God loves the physical world. He doesn't love, I mean, I, I think he does. He loves the trees and the sky and everything he created. I think he does, but that's not what that verse means. That verse means God loves humanity. He loves the creation of the world he created of people. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 8, that God commended his love towards us. We've said this before, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God loves his son. He loves Israel. He loves those that believe in Christ. And he loves the world. But most importantly of all, God loves you. He loves me. God does not love populations. He loves individuals. He does not love the masses. He loves us personally. And he loves with an almighty love that has no beginning and no end. And sometimes we need to just awaken in the middle of the night and say to ourselves, wow, he really does love me. And if you stop for a moment and you realize how good it is to have a holy and awesome and creative God love you personally. I don't know about you, but I just get overwhelmed. When I allow God's love to fill my essence of my being, I'm just overwhelmed. He really loves me. God loves me. And sometimes, I'll tell you, sometimes, you, know, you, you may not see it, but sometimes I'm pretty ugly. And sometimes I'm really ashamed of how ugly I can be. But I know that God loves me. And I know his word says that when I, I sin and I confess my sin, that he forgives me. Because he loves me. And he doesn't just love us during good times. He loves us when we're ugly. He loves us through the hard times. He loves us when he's correcting us. He loves us when he's disciplining us. He loves us like a father. He loves his son. And if we've come here today and we wondered whether or not we were in God's good graces, or if we've come here today and we've wondered if our loved one could be in God's good graces, we need to remember that God loves the world. And he wishes that not anyone should perish, but that all would come to repentance and know of his Son. As our worship team comes back, and we sing this chorus that says, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. And maybe that's the message that we need to allow to flood into our hearts and our minds this morning, that God loves me. But you know what? God doesn't love me just to love me. He wants to love me so that I can love others on his behalf. And Pastor John spent six weeks talking about that, that God has chosen us to befriend the world so that they can see God in us and experience God for themselves. And know that he loves them also. So stand with us. Oh
Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God. Jesus is waiting, God so loved. 